love on the Dundalk volunteers at a little place called Lorgan Green, about four miles, five miles from Dundalk. And uh, I told Hannigan uh, what uh, I gave Hannigan Pierce's orders, and uh, he immediately it happened fortuitously, or fortunately, whichever way you put it, uh, and that very house had ended. And the very house cars were all coming back, most of them, on their way to the north. So we st commandeered, stopped the cars, we commandeered them. We treated the people as well, but the passengers as well. Those that they treated their owners, I suppose I should say, as, as decently as we could. We found places for them and dispatched them on the road and we got into their cars and turned and Miro was setting off, as we thought, for, for Tara. Um, there was a, a, we had to stop at a little village called Castle Bennington, which at one time well known for its beer or ale, and uh, we stopped there and uh, under Hannigan's order the volunteers entered the shops and commandeered all the comestibles that they could find. Uh, Hannigan had put me in charge of the rear guard, the rear cars, and he was in the van, he was leading in the front car, and uh, just as we were about to leave, more or less, not not quite, that's to, that was a little earlier than that, and two of the ordinary RIC constables were stationed in, in the village. They came over and they began to make some inquiries about what we were doing, and they were and they were put under under control. I I put them under control uh, as prisoners, and then just and then another just as we were. I'm a little bit confused here, so I better try and clarify, clarify it, but it's... Is it not a British officer came? No, I'm not sure whether the British officer came, preceded the RIC constable, who was on the bicycle. But if we put it this way, I, I, think, it, I think that Lieutenant Dunford, who was the British officer concerned, uh, came into the village, he was riding in a, with a chauffeur-driven car, and we stopped him. We took him out. He was very, he was very reluctant, naturally, to leave. But we, there was no force or anything like that employed on him. And we persuaded him that he had a strange occurrence for him that he was a prisoner. And so we put him with the, with the other two RIC constables uh, against the standing, so a little little park in Castle Bellingham, in the centre of it. And uh, we put him beside the railings of the park. Then, just as we were about to leave, uh, an RIC man, a big, big chap, a youngish man, arrived on the bicycle and we made him dismount and we put him beside the other prisoners. And then Hannigan uh, sent me an urgent message that we were to leave immediately to get back, to get the men back to the, their cars. So I sent them back to the cars and I remained behind uh, on guard of the prisoners. Then I retreated to my own car, the car which was, and just as I was turning and getting into the car, I heard a shot. And the car was already on the move, put my head out and I, I saw, I didn't see the, the policeman, but I saw the, 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 the lieutenant quiver and tremble and fall to the ground. And I ran back and I ran up to Hannigan and I said, somebody, 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 somebody's fired a shot. And a couple of the prisoners appeared to be wounded. Well, he says, we can't stay any longer. There's a doctor and a nurse in the village and they do much better than we can do. So get into your car and walk. And that was what happened in Castle when you got to the GPO eventually, which you eventually did, can you give us a description of what you found there, what the GPO was like inside and how people were behaving? Well, uh, <laughs> it's a large building. But first of all, there was a large central hall. 
I, I think it's very much like the, the post, the central post, the general post office, as it is, as it is today. But uh, uh, well, first of all, we start with the windows. The windows were, 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 were I want to say sandbag, sandbagged, but we hadn't sand. They were filled with any sort of rubbish, old paper, anything else sort of thing was available. And at each of these windows, looking out on O'Connell Street, there was a, 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 a look out, generally armed, generally armed, as I could see, with a shotgun, not, not with a rifle. The whole rifles were very unwieldy things, you see. Uh, but that was the situation, and people seemed to be going about sort of, sort of ordinary, normal chores. You see, I, I had got in to the post office late on Thursday evening, and uh, sometime very late on Thursday evening, probably about ten, dusk, dark, darkness had fallen. Well, I, I was some some difficulty in getting across because the English, the enemy as we call them, for for, for this, this purpose, uh, were had the whole of a Connell Street under fire. And uh, they were, there was a continuous burst of, of, of rifle fire. We were received by a man who I afterwards found out was known as Captain Breen. As a matter of fact, he was the man who took, who, with Willie Pierce, carry the white flag of surrender. But uh, at that time, he verified who we were. and. Uh, saw that we got something to eat. We were given a blanket and told on the mattress and told that we could sleep and we had to report in the morning, report in the morning to Tom Clark. So on Friday morning I reported to Tom Clark, I told him what had happened. And he told me then to, uh, he, he said he'd convey that message to, to, to Mr. Pierce. And then he asked me, made some inquiries as to what, I, what, what my business was, what my occupation was. I told him, he said, well, perhaps you could help in trying to get some light in this place for this evening, you see. And so I, then I, he brought me along to uh, Jack Plunkett and Fergus O'Kelly, who were then working at it, and we tried, you see, to use the telephone, the battery, the telephone battery, it's quite a large thing, a substantial thing, the telephone batteries which are operating, trying to see if we could get some sort of en enough voltage uh, and cut in terms of to provide some sort of extemporary lighting. That was on Friday morning. Um, after a little bit, I was called away and I was I reported again to this time this time to Joe Plunkett and uh, what had happened. And uh, then I was t told to, to go to the front to put myself under the command of a chap called Dermot Lynch, who figures later in that, and he w was apparently in command of the ground floor. Was there any actual fighting going on at this time? Not at this time, no, no, no. There were occasional sniper shots. No, nothing, nothing more than that. There was uh, no. In fact, the whole of the street of O'Connor Street was well quiet and sort of subdued. No, there, there wasn't uh, anything to be seen except the ruins of the old Leary's Hotel, of this the Central Hotel, I think, and and of the Imperial Hotel. I make part. My memory is gone for these names and Leary's, which still remains in Dublin. As a feature. And the shelling mm. hadn't started? The shelling hadn't started. No, the shelling, in fact, didn't start much later. Uh, after um, about one or two o'clock, certainly about meal time, put it that way, uh, I was relieved. I had been placed at a window. I was relieved and told to go up to the dining room and get something to eat and come back. Uh, so I went up to the dining room and I was eating. When Suddenly, I heard a. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't exactly shock. A commotion. 
the part I'm looking for. And then I heard them unrolling the hoses and going up to the roof, and I heard somebody saying, Oh, Comet Plunkett has, has been hit and wounded, you see. And then the shelling started. It wasn't very, it wasn't at that time, so far as I could see, very pronounced. But, but it, was, it had started, so I went down definitely to work, to work my post again. What was the mood of people like Clark and Pierce at this time? Well, I couldn't say, and they weren't, I couldn't say they were, they weren't jubilant, they were serious, but they weren't, and anyway, they weren't on duty to stress, no sign of panic or anything like that. I'm sure they were, like everybody else, anxious, but I, I mean, uh, as to what was, how things were going to turn out, but there was no manifestation of, uh, of fright. We were ordered to assemble in the central hall, which we did. And then Pierce came along and spoke to us. Uh, very imposing, dress, very significant, and of course, uh, most of Pierce's public statements, dresses, were very impressive. Uh, so, and he told us what had happened, and that uh, congratulated us on the fight. Had been, and in a, in, a, in a way which left us all, uh, left me at any rate, I don't know about anybody else, left me in quite quite elated. As uh, something, we'd done something that had been heroic. I don't say it was heroic, but he left that impression on us. And then after a while, we were formed up in two lines. Each of us were given a, a ration of biscuit and beef and biscuit. And then, after a little while, uh, 22 files were told off. I, I happened to be in one of the, one of the later files, and we were placed under the command of a rally. And we were told that we were to to occupy Jacob's, Jacob's factory and to hold it until the main body came up. They obviously, see, it had been decided to evacuate the post office and we were a sort of an of advance party to, to capture or take over uh, Williams and Woods factory. And uh, we tried to do that, but it was, as you know, uh, not very successful. We, we, got, we turned up into Moore Street Moor Street was commanded by, 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 by the British forces. And they opened fire on us and our, our party scattered. So that was the, that's what happened then. Was that where the O'Reilly was killed? Yes, the O'Reilly was killed in that, in that, in that, in that, in that uh, attempt to get, get, get to Williamson Woods. That's where he was killed all right. There's no doubt, I think I, I think I saw him fall anyhow. But we went running up the street from Murrow. No, not running, charging up the street, trying to get up as far as we could. But it was obvious that after a little while that nothing could be done. So we, I, I didn't know Dublin very well, but we saw people turn into a, a lane. I followed through, there was about eight or ten of them. And uh, there was a, a muse stable. We blew the lock off and got in there and we started to do the, the routine street fighting drill, you see, of, 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 of knocking, of, of holding, building up communications through the party walls. And were you eventually captured? Not captured. Uh, after little while, and the following Saturday, the firing died away quite suddenly. We had a very peaceful night, and uh, I, I took command of the party, and uh, a couple of chaps who knew the district, they followed, but we had a couple of men wounded. Uh, 
very much in need of water. So these chaps went out to try and get some water, and they came back and they said they could see nobody. After a little while, just very shortly after, we heard a voice shouting, any volunteers here? And uh, as I say, as I had already written, I looked out and I saw Willie Pierce and the chap who take me into the post office on the Thursday evening, Captain Breen, walking with a white flag. That was the, that was the end of that. How were you treated when you were taken by the British? Well now, you see, first of all, there was, we were lined up on O'Connell Street and uh, then we were packed into the Rotunda Gardens. We were, we were not under shelter. We were very closely packed. Uh, I think there was one officer, and there definitely was one officer, who was very offensive. None, uh, he was the only one that I saw. What and, was the mood of and the very, very offensive to, to Tom Tom. But uh, well, I can only describe my own mood. Well, I, I won't say we, we, we were very joyful. We, we was so. We were, I would say, shall we say, we were perhaps despondent.